Well, good morning, Chapel. It's so good to see you here. It's so good to be here. Um, you're probably surprised to see me here, uh, but trust me, no one is as surprised to be here as I am. <laughs> I, I mean that. God has an amazing sense of humor. Um, two years ago, a little bit over two years ago, I had never been on a board in my life. I never wanted to be on a board anytime, and I had politely um, declined offers to be on boards. And then all of a sudden, uh, just a little bit over two years ago, I got a phone call, and it required me to pray a lot and to seek a lot of counsel and pray more. And when I finally said yes, things came in a wild rush. Before I knew it, uh, I was on the board of trustees, and that was as a multi-site church, if you remember two years ago, when we were seven campuses, all as one multi-site. And then I was on the ministry model committee, which would study and make a recommendation, ultimately, that we would become seven separate churches who were elder-led. What about Camp Carl? Then I was on the Camp Carl Evaluation Board to see what would become of Camp Carl. And then I was on the Constitution Committee to rewrite the Constitution for the chapel here in Akron. Whew, it was a whirlwind. And um, it was just such a blessing to see God guide us through that process, to see him take this church. You were all involved in that, in the vote, to bring us where we are today. He was so faithful in guiding us every step of the way, bringing our hearts together in unity, really guiding us through a maze that, frankly, I couldn't see the end from the beginning, let alone figure out how to get through it. But God knew, and it was great to follow him. So now I'm on the board of elders, the oversight elder board, and also on the Camp Carl board of directors. And um, guys, it is such a privilege and such a blessing to be here serving. Um, to come alongside uh, Tim Marrero and Nate Braun, these men have taken on huge roles and they're doing so well. We just love what they're doing. Uh, to work with the staff, the staff is fantastic. Many of them are young, they're enthusiastic, but they're very talented and so committed. And so thank them all when you see them. They're just doing a wonderful job. And then to work with all the other elders and then the men and women on the Camp Carl board is a blessing. Uh, they're talented, they're skillful, they're committed. Uh, but one thing you need to know, and I think they would all agree with me on this, is that we are all completely inadequate for the job. <laughs> now, that makes you nervous. Think how it makes us feel, right? But what I mean by that is the job is too big. I mean, we do not have the wisdom and the insight and the foresight in our own strength to make the decisions that need to be made. But the good news is God does, and we realize that. Every time these boards get together, we spend a lot of time opening his word, talking about it, and then a lot of time prayer, uh, asking for his wisdom, asking for his guidance. And he has been so kind and so faithful in uniting our hearts. Often different ideas come together and then unity and then just guiding us through this process. This has just been an amazing thing to see. Nothing at all like what I was expecting, to be frank with you. Uh, it's been a joy to be part of that. I think it's important for you to know who your elders are. We'd love to spend time with you and talk with you. And so I'll just take a couple minutes to give you a little bit of a quick background. Um, it all started uh, about 50 years ago. I've been coming to the chapel for almost 50 years now. It started March 7th, 1974. I was in the dorm, a dorm room on the 10th floor of Bulger Hall, a few hundred yards west of here at the University of Akron. Got a knock on the door, and there were these two guys who attended the University of Akron and the chapel, and they had Bibles in their hands. I thought, oh boy, what's this about? And they didn't look too scary, so I invited them in. And even though I had gone to church my entire life, they shared verses with me and the Holy Spirit guided my heart to understand them in ways that I had never seen before. Some of those verses were, were verses like um, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, I was a freshman and experiencing the freedoms that a freshman experiences when he's away from home for the first time. Nobody needed to twist my arm to convince me that I was a member of that group, all who had sinned. That was pretty patently obvious to me. But then they shared about the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, and the huge gap that separates us, but the, and how we need a savior. And then they shared John 5, 24. Jesus said, uh, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes who has sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. And that was the moment in time where I made the biggest and the best decision I ever made or will make in my life. I said, yes, I want to follow Christ. And what was this life going to look like? They shared John 10.10. 10. I've come that they might have life and might have it abundantly. And I'm here to tell you, after 50 years, that abundant life 
was so much richer, has been so much richer, has been so much more impactful than everything I could have anticipated or anything I could have planned in my own strength. So it's, it's a joy to be here. So it wasn't more than a week or two after that I started coming to the chapel. And this worship center was only two or three years old at the time. And for the older folks here, you might remember, there was orange carpeting everywhere. Orange on the seats, orange everywhere. Um, and the wives were saying, yep, this is why we don't let the men pick the colors. <laughs> right? And they were right, can't argue with that. But it was the 70s, and good taste had kind of got out of style for a while during the 70s. And uh, so eventually that changed. Uh, well, as I started coming to the chapel, attended regularly, got involved with an ABF. But just two or three weeks after that, March and April 74 were very busy for me, I met a young woman who would become my wife. Pam and I started dating, and we dated through my college years. I was in the electrical engineering program, and she was a nurse. And then I hit my senior year. We got married at the beginning of that. When I finally graduated, I crammed a four-year program into five years. Um, when I finally graduated, she informed me. She says, you know what? You can start as, your, as an engineering program in your career now. But RN actually stands for retired nurse. And I didn't realize that. So, <laughs> so I went out to work, and she stayed home. And she did the more important and the more difficult challenge of caring for our young family. So we have three kids, Ben, John, and Rachel. They're all married to wonderful spouses. We have five grandkids. They're all local. Uh, they're all walking with the Lord, solely, totally committed to him, kids and grandkids. And it is a total blessing. We don't take it for granted. Pam makes dinner every Thursday night for all of our kids and grandkids. But we also have Monday night kids. So Pam and I got involved with the uh, young adult ministry about five years ago. And that's kind of post-college age through about 30. And we host a life group every Monday night. There's 12, 15, 18 of us crammed around in our living room or out in the patio. We do life together. We have adventure programs we do together. It is a blast. And um, we love them. Uh, Max, they're sitting right over here. Hi, guys. <laughs> we love them, but they love us back really, really well. And it is a joy. One of the things that's so cool about the chapel is we have a wide range of ages. We've got a lot of younger people and we've got a lot of older people. And one of the things that's on my heart as an elder is to have more intergenerational friendships, to cross those generational boundaries. So if you're older or if you're younger, you're probably one of those groups, reach across those boundaries and see if you can make some friendships, have some community and get, get to know them. There's such a benefit from learning from people who are different age range than us. And that knowledge goes both directions. We learn from them and they learn from us. So there's my... Uh, that's my paid announcement for that one. So let's launch into John 15, verses 1 through 11. That's the passage for today. And while you're turning there, I would like to give a little bit of context. I think context is so important when we're studying the Bible. This is the last night on earth that Jesus has with his disciples. Uh, he's had the Last Supper in the upper room, and he has some things that are on his heart that he feels are vitally important to share with them. He has dismissed Judas Iscariot. Judas has gone off to plot the betrayal. He's left with the 11 disciples, and he drops some really heavy things on them. In John 13, 34 and 35, he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. Wow, okay. Me, I love him? Yeah, you love him. <laughs> okay. And so while they're processing this, continues on, John 14, verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Some verses, some translations use the word reveal or manifest or disclose. I'll, you're going to learn more about me if you follow my commandments. Wow. So they're still processing this. They hit the end of chapter 14. They don't know that they're at the end of chapter 14, but we do. And Jesus says, rise, let us go from here. So they walk down the steps from the upper room. They walk across the city, probably go across the south side uh, of the south steps up to the Temple Mount. They're going east. They go down to the Valley Kidron, kind of start working their way up the Mount of Olives. So in my mind's eye, we don't know where he stopped to talk to them in, in John 15, but in my mind's eye, I'm imagining olive trees everywhere. And maybe there's a little vineyard off to the side, and maybe he points to that when he launches into John 15. So I'll read it now. 
I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Wow. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Wow, that's a lot to process, a lot to unpack there. Let's put that into a couple sections. Let's take the first three verses first and talk about this process where God the Father is the vine dresser and he prunes the branches. Let me refresh your memory on that. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So, true confession here, I've never pruned a grapevine. But I have pruned quite a few apple trees in my side yard, often badly, but sometimes well. And as I did some research, there's a process for pruning both vines and trees. It's actually quite similar. So let's use the apple trees as an example. I go to these trees and I look at them and I see that there are a number of these branches that are going in toward the tree. Well, I want the branches to come out where the light is. If they go into the tree, they're not gonna get fresh air. More importantly, they're not gonna get light and they're not gonna be able to bear fruit. So one of the things that you do with a vine, grapevine and an apple tree, is you open it up inside and you prune away all those branches that are going into dark places. So there's a parallel in the believer's life. We all have dark places that need to be pruned out of our lives. These are wrong things done for wrong reasons. The believer's life begins with salvation, but the process of sanctification, that cleaning process, that growing in Christ, it grows through our entire life. And that's a process of turning away from the darkness, turning toward the light. If we're gonna experience the abundant life that Christ promised and the fruitful life that Jesus wants us to have, we need to confess these sinful patterns. We, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, John 1, 9. Sometimes we fall into patterns though, and we need to deal with these patterns. Pride, envy, bitterness, lust, envy. These are things that don't belong in the believer's life. And only I can decide to ask God to prune those out of my life. And only you can ask God to prune those out of your life. But the thing is, once you decide that, you are not alone. You're surrounded by Christian brothers and sisters who love you, who want to help you and care for you. They have many times gone through the same experiences and challenges that you've gone through, and they've had victory over those through God's grace. So that's why we have community. It's one of the reasons why we have ABFs and home groups and life groups and growth groups and things like that. So we can encourage one another, we can build each other up, and we can help each other aim toward the light rather than the darkness. Okay, we've pruned out those branches that are gonna go into that dark place. Now we take a step back, apple trees, Grapevines, same thing. We're seeing these little shoots that are going straight up, straight as an arrow, and they're called suckers. Not only do they look kind of ugly, but worse than that, they never bear fruit. Suckers are fruitless pursuits. They just rob the energy from the vine or from the apple tree, and they're not gonna bear fruit. So out come the lopping shears, off they go. We don't want fruitless pursuits. We all, as believers, have to deal with fruitless pursuits. I know I have. Um, and it's hard sometimes to recognize what those fruitless pursuits are and to be honest with ourselves to deal with them. But an example would be God wants us to work. He wants us to work hard. He wants to enjoy our work and enjoy the fruits of the labor. But when that career, that job becomes our idol, when it becomes the source of our identity, when it becomes the source of our self-esteem, how we think about ourselves, we've lost our focus. Um, another example, it, we, God wants us to have times of rest. He says, be still and know I'm God. He wants us to relax 
for a period of time between work. But when that recreation and leisure, and maybe I'm talking to us retired guys here, when that becomes the focus of our lives, then we've lost our focus. We, we, we can't bear fruit if our focus is on leisure and how to have fun. So let's say we've pruned those out. And that's, that's not easy to do. It takes some honesty to really examine those areas in our lives. Ask God to help us prune those out. Then we take a look at this tree again. We take a look at the vine. And it's looking pretty good. All the branches are coming out toward the light. They're kind of going generally in the right direction. There's still more pruning that needs to be done because some of these branches are long and skinny and they're not going to be able to support the weight of the fruit that we're expecting to have on those. So whether it's a vine or an apple tree, we're going to prune it back to maybe six or eight buds. I'm going to pick the last bud as one that will cause that branch to go out in the right direction toward the light. These are good things that we do for good reasons and it's hard to understand why God would prune us. Why does he bring difficulties into our lives? Why does he bring uh, challenges, things that are hard for us when we're doing the right thing? Well, the branch doesn't know why it's being pruned, does it? But the vine dresser knows why he's pruning the branch. Oftentimes he does that to strengthen us, he does that to build our faith, um, and he does it to draw us to himself. And Jesus finished this passage by saying, Sorry, um, I'm in the, <laughs> the wrong one. Um, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So we need this pruning and God's word cleanses us. So we've talked about this, about this pruning process now. Let's go turn our attention to the rest of the passage. John 15, four through 11. Let me read that again so it can kind of sink in a little bit. Verse four, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Wow, there's a lot there. The Greek word abide is menos, M-E-N-O. Um, and it means to stay or to remain. It's often used in contrast with the word, xen with the word xeno, which is the word for stranger. Uh, xenophobia is the fear of strangers. When a stranger comes into your home, he just stays for a little while and then he goes on his way and you never really get to know him. But Jesus wants to menos, he wants to abide. When Jesus comes into our life, he takes a permanent residence. He wants an eternal relationship that is deep and abiding and involves a lot of communication. Uh, that's the goal. I think this concept of abiding is so fundamental to the Christian life. It's about not what we do, but it's about who we are in Christ. And so I'd like to kind of explore that concept of, of abiding in more depth. This is family day. So we have kids with us today. It's the fifth Sunday of the month. Kids, we are delighted that you're here. Um, I brought something that maybe could serve as a little bit of an illustration of what abiding might look like. This looks like a piece of firewood out of my firewood pile, and actually it is, but I cut it in half so I could kind of give you an illustration of what's going on inside. Now this happens to be a cherry log uh, with a branch coming out, but it turns out, a little bit of research, Vines grow, vine branches grow from the vine in exactly the same way that a, a branch grows from a cherry tree. This is a lot larger and easier to see, and I had it, so I'm going to use this as an example. So pretend with me, if you will, that this is the vine, this long straight part. The bottom part goes down, is rooted into the ground. The top part goes all over the place. It's a long vine. It has branches poking out all over the place. But this branch is the believer. This is us, and we're going to focus on this particular branch. So I'd like you to notice some interesting things. First of all, this branch began growing about 20 years ago as a twig, and it started way down in here. 
How do we know that? Well, we can count the growth rings from the center out on each side. They're about 20 years of growth. So while it started as a twig, this abiding process continued year after year as that branch grew and grew stronger and stronger. It could bear more fruit and the vine grew around it in this wonderful pattern of fiber to support, to support that branch. It, it provides the strength and the support that it needed for that. And then furthermore, the outer layer of each of these growth rings for that particular year was where the sap flowed up and went out through the branch and it helped develop the fruit at the end of the branch. Okay, so what does that mean for the believer? Abiding in Christ is very similar. We abide with him. It's not just a one-time emotional event. It's a process. It's a lifelong process of abiding more deeply and more fully with each passing year. And as that happens, God strengthens us more and more. He provides the support and the strength we need to lead that Christian life. But he also supplies the sap, the lifeblood, the spiritual lifeblood that comes through us as branches and then ultimately generates the fruit at the end of the branches. Okay, make sense? Okay. So, what does that fruit look like? Um, the Bible uses the word fruit in different ways. So let's explore a couple of those. And we'll home in on one of those. Um, in one sense, fruit is anything that we do that glorifies God. In verse 8, he says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So even little things we do, acts of kindness, acts of love, that glorifies God. And that's fruit. Uh, at another level, um, fruit carries with it the seeds of reproduction. Um, a, a grape or an apple, or an acorn, has seeds within it, and those, those reproduce, just as we're to spiritually reproduce. In the parable of the sower, the seeds that fell on the good soil multiplied 30, 60, 100 times. When we share with somebody else what God has done in our life, that's the process of spiritual reproduction, and that's fruit. But I think mostly, when we think about fruit, our minds probably go to what? Galatians 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Most of you kids know a song that goes along with it. I can see the hand motions here. I'm not gonna sing it, you're safe. <laughs> um, so those are the fruits of the Spirit. How are those produced in our lives? What is the dynamic by which that fruit is produced out at the end of the branch? Let's take a look at three of these fruits, love and peace and joy. Jesus told his disciples over and over how they're to love. He said, love the Lord your God with all your soul and strength and might, right? He said, love your neighbor as yourself. And then John 14, he says, love one another, even as I have loved you. So we know that we're supposed to love each other. That's part of living the Christian life. And we try, don't we? We work really hard. Sometimes we work hard to love people who frankly aren't all that lovable. And we work hard at it. And then they say or do something and it brings all those negative feelings back again. And we say, ah, oh, Jesus, how can you tell me to love? It's so hard. I keep trying, but it's difficult. What's wrong here? Here's what I think is wrong. The branch has two ends. This end is the end of the fruit. And this end is where it abides in the vine, right? This is where it's connected to the vine. When we focus on the fruit, when we just try really hard to love somebody, we're doing that in our own strength. And frankly, we just don't have the ability to do that. But when we focus on this end, the abiding end of that branch, we're experiencing the love that Jesus has for us. We're experiencing this all-consuming, unconditional love, the sacrificial love that he died for us. And we're realizing how vast and immeasurable that love is. And then we're expanding that. We're realizing, hey, he loves these other people just like he loves me. We begin to look at other people through Jesus' eyes. And all of a sudden, that love of Jesus overflows in our lives, comes out of the vine, goes through the branches, and it produces the fruit that people see. And that's a love that endures. That's a love that's unconditional, that doesn't depend on how somebody responds to it, because it, they're not the reason for it. Jesus is the source of that love. Let's talk about peace, another fruit of the Spirit. We all want peace in our lives. And I don't know of a time in my life where I have seen, among the population in general, more anxiety, angst, uh, worry even, concern. Um, so what do we do? We read self-help books. We seek counsel. Uh, we try calming exercises. And many of these things are very helpful. I'm not saying they're bad. Many of these things are really good and they're helpful. But here again, are we focusing too much 
on trying to generate that fruit of peace by ourselves, or are we spending time abiding in Christ, the Prince of Peace? Jesus said in just the previous chapter, chapter 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So when we abide in Christ, when we develop that relationship over a period of months and years and decades, we start to realize we're serving the God of the universe. He has everything in control. He sees the end from the beginning. He's not constrained by time and space as we are. And you know what? It's gonna be okay if we're following him. And that peace overflows in our hearts. It comes out the branch and it produces the peace that people see. People don't see the abiding, they see the peace. And they say, wow, how come you're calm? You're in the middle of the storm. There's a hurricane around you. And you can just smile and think, okay, yeah, but I'm in the eye of the storm. I'm where it's peaceful. Joy. How many of us want more joy in our lives? And we seek joy. We really work hard for it. Sometimes we do it in healthy ways, sometimes in unhealthy ways. Uh, is it in your relationships? Is it in our career? Uh, is it in material things? All these come up short. They all come up somewhat empty at some point in our lives. But what did Jesus say in verse 11? Here's the word my again. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So we, when we abide in Christ, we experience his joy. And I can tell you over almost 50 years of following him, I've experienced a lot of joy. No joy compares with the joy of being, abiding in Christ. That's the ultimate joy. And that's just here on earth. Imagine what it'll be like in heaven. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. When we abide in him and experience his joy, that joy flows from the vine through the branch out to the, out to the fruit. And people then look and they see what true joy looks like. They may not understand the source, but that's our job is to explain that to them, isn't it? Sometime during the summer, uh, I like to walk around the apple trees and look at the apples. And true confession here, Pam will tell you this, I'm not a very good gardener, so we don't get a lot of apples. <laughs> but I like to keep trying at it. And I'll just enjoy watching the apples go from these little green things in June. They get bigger, they get a red blush. They eventually get sweet and I can eat them. In all the times I've enjoyed watching the apple trees grow and just seeing how they're doing that, one thing I've never seen is an apple tree straining to produce fruit. I've never seen an apple tree going, oh, I'm going to pop these apples out if it kills me. No, they don't do that. It's effortless. Why is that? Well, the branch is connected to the apple tree. And that sap, that life force flows from the apple tree, flows through the branch, and it's an effortless process. It takes time, but over time, that fruit develops naturally because the branch is abiding, is abiding in the tree. So it is with us. This, this only happens when we abide in Christ. And when we've tried to do it on our own, what did Jesus say? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Abide in me. By the way, when I read that passage again, I don't know if you noticed the, word, the use of the word abide. Jesus used that word 10 times in eight short verses. I think that concept was really important to him. So we, if we stop there, I would be doing a disservice because we have to ask the question, how do we actually abide in Christ at a practical level? It's one thing to say, go abide in Christ, but it's just not conjuring up emotions. There are things that we can do to abide more fully in Christ. And two things come to mind. Jesus did not tell his disciples specifically in this passage, here's how you abide in me. But he lived with them for three years and he gave them a lot of instruction earlier in his ministry. And the verse I go back to often is Luke 9, 23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus told his disciples this shortly after he asked them, who do people say I am? Who do you say I am? They said, you're the Christ. He explained how he was going to be crucified. And then he said, take up your cross and follow me. Uh, this verse was something that was really meaningful to me early on in my Christian life, not even a year old in, in Christ. I was at a Navigator conference and I wrote this date down in the Bible in circle, probably the only date in that original Bible, December 29th, 1974, because it was a pivotal moment for me to deal with this verse. This verse was hard for me, guys. It was really hard. I thought to myself, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I thought, I don't know if I can deny myself. And I'm pretty sure I don't want to deny myself. But what I do want to do is follow Christ. 
I know that. I'm committed to that. So I committed to following him and doing my best to deny, to deny myself, but focusing on the following him part and see what would come. Why was this verse so hard for me to deal with as a young believer? Well, I think the answer is that I was, had only begun the process of abiding him. I did not yet realize who it was I was being asked to follow. I didn't know his character. Fast forward almost 50 years, and I see his faithfulness in, in my life. I see his guidance in every step of the way, doing things that I never would have done in my own wisdom or, or power. I see his, his uh, love, his incredible love for me, his wisdom, his power, every step of the way. And I say, wow, why wouldn't I follow him now? Not that it's always easy, but I say, this just makes sense. It's kind of a no-brainer. Why would I follow my own aimless wanderings when I can follow the good shepherd who says, I will make you lie down by green pastures and walk beside still streams? And it's not always green pastures and still streams, right? Sometimes it's an adventure. God has an amazing adventure for us, but we can only experience that as we follow him. And that involves obedience and, and submission. If there is no obeying, there's no abiding. But there's a really interesting cycle that takes place here. As we begin to obey him, Jesus says what? I will reveal myself to you. I will manifest myself to you. As we begin to obey him, we start to abide in him more. We start to understand more of his character. And all of a sudden, we realize his love for us. And it becomes a little bit easier to obey him next time. And that starts up a cycle where, okay, I'm obeying you more. And Jesus reveals more of himself to us as we obey him more. And it sets up a spiral. And that spiral goes inward. And it centers on Jesus. And that all starts with the obeying process. The second thing I think is so important about abiding in Christ is spending time with him. Um, Have you ever seen a marriage or a close friendship where there's a lot of unity, uh, intimacy, good communication, but they, well, they actually never talk to each other. (laughs) They don't see each other. Maybe once a week they see each other, right? No, that can't happen. The, the only way you have a really deep, meaningful relationship is by spending time with each other and talking to each other. Our abiding in Christ is the same kind of relationship. It involves time. It involves time spent with him, listening to him through his word, time speaking back to him through prayer, and listening to, to the Holy Spirit as he speaks back in our lives during that time and throughout the day. So this idea of spending time is really important, and we can see this still back in the same verse. Luke nine twenty three says, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow after me. I checked several translations. I looked pretty hard. Could not find any translations that said, take up your cross weekly and follow me. (laughs) They They all said daily. And I think there's a reason for that. We need that nourishment. We need that time with the Lord every day. And so it's just vital to our growth as believers and abiding. So I'm gonna make a really bold statement here. Um, I don't know how we can fully abide in Christ without spending daily time in his word and in prayer. I think it's just that critical to the Christian life to really live it the way it's meant to be lived is we need to spend time um, daily in the word and in prayer. Now, how we do that, there's a wide variety of reasons, and I don't want to be prescriptive because there are many ways of doing that work very well for people. And God is a God of infinite creativity. And, and so, but I do want to give an example of how it, has worked for me and it's been really life changing and maybe this will be helpful for you as well. Um, it was a few, it was quite a few years ago, um, there was a guy uh, actually in the brigade program and he challenged all the men and boys in brigade, uh, usually early in January, did it several years, he said, you guys need to read through the Bible in a year and here's a reading plan, go do it. <laughs> First year or two, I said, no, no, maybe not, we'll see. I don't know if I have enough time for that. But finally I did that. And I realized that what appeared to be a really bold ask initially actually was one of the kindest invitations I could have ever received. And I started that process. I went through the Bible. I said, wow, this puts a lot of things in context. And then the second year, I went through the Bible again. And and more things were becoming clear. And then the third year and the fourth year. And so this morning, I finished year 14. And then tomorrow morning, I get to start year, year 15. I don't say that to impress you. I just talked to a friend of mine who has gone through the Bible every year for the last 40 years. I think, wow, what I would have learned if I would have started a long time ago. Um, so I want to encourage you to do, to spend time in the Bible like that. Now, it sounds like it's a lot of time. It sounds like it's hard to do. 
But the good news is you've all done hard things. Um, it's the process of starting something that new that's difficult. After a month or two, it kind of becomes natural. Uh, many of you exercise. You might be in a weight training program or running. Remember what those first few weeks were like? It was really challenging to get up in the morning and do that. But then a few months into it, you were in a groove, really enjoying it. Uh, a couple years into it, you said, I can't imagine not doing this. Others of you are saying, what is this exercise thing of which you speak? <laughs> and that is okay. I'm not here to guilt you over that. But here's another example. We all started work probably at some point in our lives. Remember what it was like putting in that first eight-hour day? That was really challenging. We came home exhausted. I see something with some of the young adults. I kind of smiled and said, yeah, it was hard. I remember that. 40-hour weeks, wow, they want me to do this again? Um, <laughs> this is really hard. But then a few months, a few years into it, we're just kind of doing it. It's natural, right? Some of you have learned to play an instrument. Some of you have learned a new language. A lot of you are studying in college. You learned how to study. It took me a while to really learn how to study, which I had to do to get through engineering school. These are all difficult things, but once we get into the pattern, we can do it. But here's the thing. We all make investments in our time based on the ROI, the return on that, on that investment, right? The ROI on the time you spend in the Bible is so much greater than any other investment you make with your time. Um, and Paul knew that, and he told that to Timothy. Uh, in Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 7, Paul told Timothy, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness or Christ-likeness is of value in every way. So this training for godliness, this, um, these spiritual disciplines that we talk about, especially time in the word, time in prayer, um, it's just kind of like exercise. We make a goal, uh, we set a goal, we make a plan, we try to be consistent. If we fail, we just start back over again. We don't give up. And then eventually, we reap the rewards. No matter what that training process is, it's very similar. But when you spend time in the Word and time in prayer every day, the benefits are so much greater. And those benefits extend over two entirely different time scales. Okay, the first is the daily part of that. Uh, I'll give you an example of what I do. I talked with somebody after the first service, and he said he and his wife read the Bible together. That's really cool. Uh, for me, what I do is I'll spend a little bit of time sandwiching the Bible reading between times of prayer. Just open up with the time of prayer. Say, Lord, open my heart. Quiet my mind. Show me what you have for me today. Then if I'm, as I read through the Bible, I'm reading about three chapters a day on average. That's about 15 minutes, maybe 20. And I read through that. But then I go into a time of prayer. Uh, Acts is a good model. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, ACTS. A lot of good models, a lot of different ways of doing this. This is one example of a devotional time or a, or a quiet time. There are many other examples that I hope you who are doing that will be bold enough to share that with your friends because we all want to learn from you. So what happens though at, throughout the day is the Holy Spirit is bringing back those things into my mind. He's bringing back the things that I learned that we talked about during that quiet time. And it's so valuable. That's the nourishment that I need to get through that day. Now, what's happening at a totally different time scale, though, is as I read through the Bible, I'm seeing it in context. I'm seeing that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are identical. They have the same character. I'm understanding what that character is. I'm marveling at Jesus' uh, wisdom as he teaches his disciples. I'm seeing the examples of of faithful men and women in the Bible as they live through much more difficult struggles than I will probably will ever live through. And so this sets up a spiritual foundation, a foundation that grows year after year after year, just like the growth rings on the branch. It grows by year by year, and it sets this foundation up that makes walking the Christian life so much easier as you mature in Christ. So... Um, there are many different ways to start reading the Bible regularly. And I, again, I don't want to be prescriptive. I started out reading a, a, the hard copy of the Bible, and I love that. It forced me to figure out where all the chapters were, all the books were. Um, I currently use a, like a Bible reading app. I like Olive Tree, but the U version is good, blue letter vi version of the Bible. There are many of these. A lot of these have Bible reading plans associated with those. You can download those, and it'll prompt you throughout the day. Um, we've put in your bulletin a link to our resources page, or you can go to the chapel resources page. There's some links there to dip different Bible reading plans. But really, I'd encourage you just to Google Bible reading plans. <laughs> it's that simple. You will be inundated with different plans. And, uh, you know, just try some out. Uh, there are many different types. I started out with one that's called the genre plan. 
And what that means is every day of the week is a different genre. Uh, one day of the week I'm reading Psalms, one reading I'm the, the law in the Old Testament, the first five books. Another day I might be reading the epistles, another, another day the gospels, another day Proverbs, things like that. That's a really cool way to start reading the Bible because you get a sampling all over it. Uh, I love a chronological plan because it puts everything in context. Some start in Genesis and in Revelation. I personally love one that starts in the beginning of the Old and New Testament simultaneously and kind of goes through. By the, and just this morning, I finished up with uh, Malachi and Revelation. And tomorrow morning, I start with Genesis and Matthew. So there are a lot of different ways of doing that. But I'd encourage you to just investigate what different reading plans are um, and pray about it. And pray about starting. Because um, I think you'll find, if you do that, um, it is a life-changing experience. And then, of course, we don't read the Bible just to read it. We couple that with prayer. Make that part of your devotional time when you really have that one-to-one -one time with the Lord. Um, and the good news is um, your timing, your timing is impeccable because tomorrow is January 1st. It's the, <laughs> it's the first day of a new year. So it's a great time to start. I've been speaking almost completely to believers, to Christ followers here who want to go deeper in their walk with the Lord, uh, who want to abide with him, who want to bear more fruit. But if you're not at that point yet, if you're a, at the point where you're not yet a branch, um, but you want to learn more about that, we are so glad that you're here. We love you and we want to encourage you. And I want to, I want to tell you that every Christ follower in this room is where you were at one point in their life. We're all on a spiritual journey. And we want to share the joy that we know in Christ with you. So please, talk to the person that you came with. We'll be down front. We'd love to talk with you, answer questions, pray with you, encourage you. So just want to open up that invitation. We'd love to do that. Um, so let's review where we've been. Uh, first of all, God the Father is a vine dresser. He prunes us so that we'll bear more fruit. Jesus is the vine, we're the branches. If we abide in him, we'll bear fruit. But apart from him, we can do nothing. No matter how hard we try, nothing internal will come of it. Abiding requires submission and obedience, but it gets easier with the abiding. And it also requires time with him, which also gets easier with the time with him. And finally, the last thing is, why? I had a, I had a choice of talking about anything today. Um, it, but I've been studying this, I've been meditating this passage for over a year. And it just has been so meaningful to me. And so the why here, Jesus tells us in verse 11, and it's the same why for me, why I wanted to talk about this. Jesus said in verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And that's my prayer for each of you, that your joy may be full. Let's, let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are so good. We are amazed that the God of the universe, our creator, wants an intimate and eternal relationship with each of us. You want to abide in us and us in you. Teach us how to know you more fully, even as we are fully known by you. Teach us to abide in you as you abide in us. For that, dear Lord, is the desire of our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This has been a message from the chapel in Akron, Ohio. Thanks for joining us today. Our Sunday morning services are at 9 and 1040 a.m. You can join us online for our services by going to akronlive.thechapel.life. For more information about the chapel, please visit our website at thechapel.life.